Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the world's biggest stars and some of my favourite people and a man I've admired for 30 years. Richard Nijins, how are you? I'm very, very well. 30 years, so... Teenagers together, was it? Not quite. I mean, I remember you as a kid because back in the 80s, I mean, there you were on the telly and I just couldn't believe how quick you were. And then today in researching this interview, I went back on YouTube and sort of revisited those lyrics that you did back in the day that you're still doing today. You're still on tour, selling out these venues. You don't make life easy for yourself, do you? I've been around a long time. But I think probably with the exception of, I don't know, someone like Ken Dodd or something like that, I probably have the loyalist crowd there is in British showbiz. There's not a lot of them. I, I totally accept that. But they're such good to work with. And they love to hear, got any new songs? And then it's easy for me because they like the old ones, as you said. And then they're really chuffed if they hear a new one. So I can essentially do whatever I want. The bar is as high or as low. And I'm very lucky like that because I don't work with anybody else. I have, as long as I get from A to B, I can get there in any direction or route I choose. <laughs> so no, I don't put myself through it. If, I'm, if I've got a song that isn't quite ready, I'll leave it. I have on many occasions said, look, I've got a new song. And for all of us who perform, the hardest thing is to do it for the first time. Right. A bit like Amdrams when you go out there, and you, ooh, you know, or getting up and doing a wedding speech or something, it's horrific. And it's the same with us when we've got a new song. And I often say to them, I've got a new song, I'll probably louse it up. But if you'd like to hear what I can do so far, yeah, 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 yeah. And when you take that pressure off yourself, nine times out of ten, you remember all the words. Yeah. And of course, once you've done it once, you're off and running. So. But, I mean, they're so clever. And obviously, your, your game is wordplay and the use of words. I mean, when you look at Sod's Law or any of those, I mean, they're so clever. Are there moments on stage where you look out there and you think, I have no idea what's coming next? And then where do you go with it? I have a mild idea what's coming next. But as I just said, it's A to B with me in any route I choose. <laughs> um, I think... I was never going to be mega, mega famous as a wordsmith. I'm Perhaps if I'd gone a little bit, not bluer, but, you know, a bit more sort of club actor or whatever, uh, I, I probably would have, um, yeah, probably would have got bigger crowds, but it's not what I set out to do. I mean, in years and years ago when I left college, I'll be totally truthful, and, I, uh, and this isn't really documented particularly, but... I was at college in Glasgow and I come from London as you can hear and and in those days, I know all about Glasgow now, but in those days it was a bit of a rough house. And for someone coming from West Ham to see Glasgow was a rough house, it was a rough house. <laughs> and the only place I could find solace, you know, and a bit of peace was, was I saw a poster for the College Folk Club. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know anything about the music because I was into the Rolling Stones and whatever it was. And I went in this college folk club and it was really nice, little candles on the table. I sat there, listened to a bloke. And the resident of the college folk club was this unknown bloke called Billy Connolly. And I looked at him and uh, all I remember about him was the blokes used to buy him pints of beer and the girls used to chat him up. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? That's the only two reasons I've gone to college. <laughs> Why don't I get a guitar? And, and from there on in, I had a, a good run of folk history if you like um, culminating by being with Steel Ice Man and then I turned into the see, see the, the lucky vein I hit really was um, I was a simple act in as much as I had no drummer I had no bass player and so all the top names wanted me to support them because I took up no space on stage. <laughs> Their roadies could clear off and get a drink, you know, and all that. So they loved me. It, they didn't care how good or bad I went down. <laughs> I was just easy. And in the 70s, um, it was sort of late 70s, 75 onwards, I, um, I toured with, and these are national tours. I, I mean, I did Jeff Rotel, Songs from the Wood and heavy horses tours I did Super Tramp Breakfast from America uh, Elkie Brooks I was worked with for four and a half years Joan Armour Trading David Essex um, there was endless endless tours and of course that taught me my trade of working in these theatres where we are tonight because I'd only ever worked in little clubs 
And all of a sudden, I was a bit of a cuckoo. I was nicking their other people's audiences and learning the art of impressing them, not being a great guitar player or a singer, just by, you know, contact. And it was probably the best apprenticeship I could ever, ever have done. And so when I joined the likes of, let's say, Jim Davidson after, during the Falklands War and all that stuff, I had had a really good grounding on what the other industry was away from where I learnt my trade as a guitar player, you see. So it was very easy to s or make it all slot into place. It was accidental. I never even meant to go on telly, to be honest. It, uh, I certainly didn't expect my own show or anything like this. I just wanted to play the guitar. Turns full circle and here I am still loving what I do and just playing the guitar, which is going back to where I started, you know, with John Martin songs and whatever, and some of the folkies will remember him. And, um, and I, I have turned a full circle and I love what I do. I'm, I'm, maybe I was in a bit of a wilderness for a few years where you drop out a telly and you only do what I call, this is, please don't take this the wrong way, but B shows like Countdown. What I mean by that is they're not A shows like your own show. Right. I, I, that's not a derogatory sense of yeah. B, it means they're not an A. And I did hundreds of those countdowns and uh, and I was, I think I was losing the plot a little bit. I just thought, here we go again, up to Leeds, five shows in a day, different shirts. And you could just go through the motions, you know, and just do all them shows and then go home. And that is not me. I'd have to write a poem for every show. I'd have to come up with a story for every show. No cheating. <laughs> and um, and basically, I was getting tired of it all. And, and uh, it was when I was 60, actually, I um, decided there's no half measures. You mm. either kick showbiz in or you go with it. You can't play the middle game. Otherwise, you look like a, a cobwebbed bit of a has-been, you know. And I decided to kick it all in and go back to my guitar playing and my stories which I've always loved and wanted to do in the first place. Luckily, my grounding was in radio, and uh, and therefore uh, I kept my contacts and, and still do a lot of documentary work for radio. And on TV, as I say to an audience, I'm in your houses every day, in your living rooms every day, but you don't know, because I do so much of that guitar stuff you hear on the background of antique programs and house buying programs and whatever. <laughs> And that is a brilliant, brilliant income. You know, it's good PRS, as we call it, for the non-musical people. And um, and that alone would be a really good job for me, but I like to be out here. I like to be in the sharp end, and I like to test myself. I'm not bothered about years. That don't bother me. I just think, well, I've been doing it longer than most, but still getting away with it. That's how I look at it. And it's interesting, the perception as well, because I would say, oh, he's really funny, he's a great comedian and musician. But would you say you're a brilliant musician firstly and then a comedian? I would indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I learnt my trade as a musician. Uh, the highlight of my whole career was to do a duet with Brian May of Queen. It certainly wasn't um, to go on stage with, I don't know, any comedian you wish to name, and God knows I've worked with a few. Um, I do like comedians, but... When I worked with Steve Martin in America, who's very famous, uh, he's a movie star and um, and he's he's a comedian, I suppose, but he's also probably one of the world's greatest banjo players. And and when we worked together, and we used to, <coughs> excuse me, we used to do dueling banjos as a, a an encore because in America, and if you play banjo, you can't get away without playing dueling banjos. Otherwise, <laughs> there's a, another war of independence. You know, <laughs> um, but when Steve and I used to chat. Um, it was never about comedy. It was always about music. He was fascinated by British folk music and I was equally fascinated by country or bluegrass or Appalachian music that he loved. And, and it was the common factor and the common denominator of us working together. And that's maybe, it sounds twee, I'm not a twee person by any stretch, trust me. But I know it sounds twee when, when you say that music is such an international language-y thing. Because I worked in America and died on my backside, you know, to the point, I just thought, what's the point of this? You know, hey, you're a real cockney, <laughs> you know. And, um, and I gave up. And it, it wasn't until I went back and I, and I did a tour with um, Steve Martin and then, um, 
um, uh, Billy Swan, the Allman Brothers, stuff like that, you know, where I felt back in at home. So the answer to your question is, yeah, it has to be music. Um, I knew I wasn't, see, I came up at the same time as Ralph McTell, who wrote Streets of London, but I wasn't in Ralph's league as a, a lyricist or certainly a singer. I may have just got near him as a guitar player, but not not as a great songwriter. And it was Ralph, who is a really good mate of mine now, who made me realise, you ain't got a great voice, but if you make your stories longer, you ain't got to sing so much. And that's what my whole career was. It started off as a singer, introducing songs, and then it became the stories becoming quite paramount and then putting the songs in between. And now, because I've leveled out and I'm a lot older, it's probably about 50-50, but I only ever, ever, ever do what I want to do. And that's the greatest thing that anyone can ever say about their about their jobs and you know the way they pay their bills. I'm just a very, very happy bloke, and I think that's fantastic. Yeah, and that means you've won. You're unique, and that's, of course, why you've got on so many shows, the Raw Varieties and things. And, of course, at those events, you get to meet heroes. Um, I know James Taylor was a man who you really loved and admired. They can sometimes let you down, these people who are somewhat bigger than you and you want to meet. Well, certainly James Taylor did, yeah. I was devastated. James Taylor, for me, is just just below God. Yeah. And uh, and when I was learning guitar and I was learning Fire and Rain and in my mind I'm going to Carolina and you know all the stuff, mm. he was my idol. Um, he was just superb, and I did the London Palladium with him actually. And um, he did, of course he didn't know me from Adam. I mean, why would he? But uh, but I waited till he walked down the corridor. They're very narrow corridors at the Palladium because it's such an old theatre and it's crammed into shops and houses. So the Palladium, although it's big uh, from the public's perception, backstage, it is a complete rabbit warren or even not that, it's a hamster warren. It's <laughs> tiny. And I kept looking, peeping out my little, pokey little dressing room, waiting for him to go. And there he was and he came down you know, no air, but I'm fine one to talk. Um, and there was James Taylor. And uh, I, was, I was amazed how tall he was. That's the first thing I remember. And I went up to him and I said, um, hi, James, just wanted to say hello. You were a massive inspiration to me, you know. And uh, when I learned to play the guitar, I learned to play through um, a lot of your stuff. And he just said to me, is that so? And walked right <laughs> past me. <laughs> And they say, never meet your heroes. Yeah. And I'm not saying I didn't want to meet James Taylor. It was an honour, you know. Um, and through my radio days of Capital years and years ago, doing the Nebworth gigs and the playing to half a million people, you know, and going on before the Beach Boys and stuff like that, I was never phased, never, ever phased going on before Santana or whatever. I just loved it. Um, but when you meet your hero... And he don't want to even say hello or pass the time of day. Yeah, it can be devastating. I'm only a punter, the same as everybody else. Right. You know. Yeah, it's wounding, isn't it? Um, yeah. The radio days are interesting because it's changed so much. I almost wish I could have tried it in your day. I think it was much more fun when there were much bigger personalities. For sure. I mean, I was quite lucky because I was in London, and uh, and the stories that that go with my life are brilliant because um, I did basically an acoustic show. I wouldn't call it a folky show because there was blues and whatever it was that went. Um, but the acoustic show <coughs> was actually um, quite well received for a few years. Did it for a long time. I only went for six weeks to Capitol when it opened with Kenny Everett and various other people, you know, Smithy and um, Michael Aspel and so on. We were the rear guard of that early Capitol Radio stint. And it was, you'd imagine how amazing it was. It was just... Absolutely fair. There were no rules like the BBC, you know, we could play what we wanted, do what we wanted, and it was absolutely fantastic. And we had a little canteen. It wasn't very big. Um, and they used to put on the, I remember it, just by where you got your tea and coffee, they used to put little circulars up on who was coming in for an interview. And I always got the ones that no one else was that bothered <laughs> about, mainly because they, they didn't know them. Like, for example, Arlo Guthrie, who would be a massive massive person to me Woody Guthrie's son Alice's Restaurant all the legends of what I am a folkie 
and no one wanted to interview Arlo Guthrie. Um, and so I did. And then I was sitting with Mike Smith, the late Mike Smith, sadly, and, uh, and I was just glancing across as we were chatting and it said, Joni Mitchell. Now, if, if you want to put me in front of anyone, <laughs> put me in front of her. Do what we're doing now, me and you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and she came in with her PR man, like they all do, you know, the big stars and so on. And the first thing that hit me was how tiny she was. And the second thing that hit me, you bear in mind she's Joni Mitchell, you know, the goddess of maybe folk music or whatever. She chain smoked through this interview. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And they give you the questions. Yeah, you, if you ask Joni these six questions and why are you doing the Royal Festival? Don't forget it's London. Right. You know, and um, what do you think of being in England? And here's your six questions. Richard, if you'd like to ask them to Joni, she'll be delighted to answer them. The same as she did in nine other radio stations before mine and 17 others in the <laughs> afternoon that followed. And I did it. I did it as, as, as she requested. And then I said at the end, Joni, before you go, I just want to ask you about your guitar tuning because you drop your E string to D and then tune to A. So you basically got a G chord. And she said, pardon? I said, well, it's open tuned, it's, it's G. And she said, well, yes. She said, I think it was Graham Nash that taught me that. <laughs> she said, but yeah, that was, and I said, well, that's your trademark, open G tuning. And she said, no one has ever, ever asked me that in an interview. And what I felt like saying was, well, yes, but if you give people a piece of paper with what questions to ask, they won't. But I was just a, such an adoring fan of Joni Mitchells and Guthrie and James Taylor that I, I felt I had the right to just ask them the questions I wanted to ask. And Joni Mitchell was very taken that she could actually drop her guard and talk about guitaring and, and um, Woodstock and stuff like that. And when it finished... Um, she said to me, is there anywhere around here I can get a cup of coffee? And I remember her PR man saying, Joni, we've got another interview. She said, leave it. Is there anywhere, Richard, where we can get a cup of coffee? <laughs> and we went up to the canteen, me and Joni Mitchell, and we talked about guitars and her whole connection with the folk scene. And, uh, you know, because her real name is Roberta Anderson. And, and she was married to uh, a folkie called someone or other, Mitchell. Chuck Mitchell or something but that's how she got her name you see and it was just a fascinating day in my life and that was all through radio and I, I wouldn't take that back a million but I never did working man's clubs I never did comedy clubs I didn't do anything like that I came through music and accidentally fell into television I suppose that's the story of where I am and um, um, is it big not particularly but compared to lots of people yes i suppose it is compared to the big boys no do i care not in the slightest yeah. as i said um, a <laughs> couple of paragraphs ago i'm a very happy bloke so i don't really care and going back to those days with these amazing people who you spoke to are there any tapes around of those or have they all gone in the mists of time well it wasn't it wasn't so much the mist of time it was the uh, it was the quality uh, because of course it was all real to real in those days it's not all the sophisticated stuff that that you young teenagers like you have got <laughs> and um and it didn't, unless it was the BBC, um, they had a yellow dust coat on their tapes. And that's why some of the BBC shows, some of them have stood the test of time. Uh, I've got some Hancock ones at home that are quite sacred, you know. Um, but in, in terms of your bog standard Bass F or Ampex tapes, um, no, they weren't going to really stand the test of time. The sad thing for me is some of the shows I did where I I did a Jethro Tull acoustic show, which is amazing. They never played acoustic, you know, and to get the boys to do it. Elkie Brooks I got to do um, as a, on piano, a bit like she would have started with um, whoever she started with, not Johnny Dankworth, but one of those. Um, Dave Edmonds and, and um, Nick Lowe doing an acoustic gig. And... Um, Oh, Carleen Carter, who was related to Johnny Cash, all those people, and of course Brian May, and all, all those people uh, I met through having a radio show, and we did it exactly how we wanted to do it, but unfortunately, you're right, it, it's not around anymore, 
my, my most sacred one because I like blues guitar um, there's a, obviously one of the one of the best blues guitars was Rory Gallagher and I did a great session with him just like we're doing now and if I could ever have that back I would just listen to it in the bath every day because it was just gentle it was just a nice musician um, talking good solid music conversation and uh, and I loved it but no none of them are around anymore uh, maybe if someone taped them off the radio but they would only be on cassette and these days it's actually quite hard to get a cassette to copy over you know onto where, wherever you're going to put it you know so um, the answer is no I certainly haven't got any of them I've just got the memories what about doing a daily show again on the radio or just doing a weekly show I mean you, you've got such a great voice and such a great way with people I mean that's why you're so popular on stage have you time for that or have you no interest I have got the time and I have the interest, but no one contacts me. That's the truth. And before I ever agree, like when you got in touch with me and said, would you do an interview? I don't want to do six questions you're going to ask me. Thank you very much. I'm just a, a bloke and I will answer any question as honestly as I possibly can. Sometimes you come a cropper doing that. You can, <laughs> well, you do, you know. Um, but the truth of the matter is, I mean, I had long standing series on Radio 2. Um, for many years before I went into telly, I was on Radio 2 for about 10 years with my own show. People don't really remember that. Well, the ones that do are probably dead. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I did a long stint on Radio 2. But would they ask me now? No. And there's a very simple reason, is I haven't got an agent. And so therefore, um, it would be a trial to get older me. Although you can do it, those who want to do it will do it. And that suits me down to the ground but I haven't got someone touting for me. So every single gig, every single interview, like yourself, everything I do is because someone has contacted me. And I think that is a fantastic way to be. Even tonight, we'll only play to, um, I don't know, a couple of hundred or something in a big theatre. Do I care? No, I didn't build the theatre. Um, it doesn't bother me, but the theatre came on and said, you know, you're not our biggest selling thing, but we love to see you and, you know, you, we always have a cup of tea and so on. Radio, I know if someone gets in touch, they want to talk to me rather than, you know, oh, it's Digence, he wants to plug his new album, you know, and all the other stuff. No, I don't. I've got nothing to plug. Um, and so it's a, a strange one. I'm, this may sound a bit arrogant, but I'm a little surprised that the BBC, especially because I've got such a track record with them, has never been in touch and said, do you want to do a show? Um, the night Richard Whiteley died, uh, I was sitting in for him. I was driving to Leeds to sit in for him to, to chair Countdown. The night he died. And Susie Dent in Dictionary Corner rang me up and said, um, have you heard Richard's died? And I said, no. And um, then a couple of minutes later... Uh, um, the, the producer rang and said, oh, you might as well turn round because we can't do a show because Richard's just passed away. So I actually drove to Susie's house and we opened a bottle of wine and, and toasted um, Richard Whiteley, who was a really, really nice guy, I've got to say. Um, and they sort of offered me the role of taking on Countdown. But you see, I had two daughters. I'm a single parent, two daughters. I couldn't go and live in Leeds for six days a week, five days a week. You know, I, I don't live up that way. And um, and I think it, I fell out of favour, even though you go on YouTube and all the big countdowns and my poems and things like that, I don't think they like me. I think that's the truth, and I'm quite open to say it on your interview. I don't care. Um, and also new people come in behind the scenes, and a lot of them are graduates coming in from uni. I would not dispute for one minute a lot of them probably don't even know who I am um, even though I did tons of countdowns I did it in uh, but an interesting tweet just the other day was um, Rufus Hound was on and there was a tweet that said it's great to hear Rufus doing some poems it was just like countdown in the glory days with Richard Digence I read it and I was so chuffed and I was too embarrassed to retweet it because it looked arrogant and big headed but I thought, oh, wow, someone remembers. Um, but yes, I'd love to. I love radio. I mean, way, way back, I started in hospital radio. So, yeah, I've got a passion for radio. Um, 
and I like what it stands for. I like the, the vision, the imagination, and you know, voice being more important maybe than visuals at times. And 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 it's honest. That's the nice thing. Um, but I've never been invited. That is the answer to your question. As honest as I can be, television wise, I won't. I'm not that interested in doing silly guest slots like celebrity squares and all that nonsense. And, and no, I, if I was to go on, I'd be me. Um, but they don't want me. You know. It, it's not what the modern world is is all about and I quite accept that but here in a theatre I am in my natural habitat so I don't really worry about the other things well and it's your show you control it you do what you want and the punters who are coming in are buying into your party aren't they and there's no greater compliment than that they're turning up to see what you do and that's nice that's right well it's tonight a small crowd but every one of them's had a bath or whatever they've had, they've, they've woke they've, they've, I hope so yeah so do I <laughs> mind you not all of them and um, no but they've got ready you know they've had to make plans maybe they've got their dinner early or something and, and they've got ready to come and see the show which I think is incredibly complimentary to be honest with you um, I don't care how many there are even if there's four of them at least those four people have made the effort to come and see you and I think you should take that as a real real huge compliment the strange thing about this business, especially show business and not so much music business, is that it seems the bigger you get, the more detached you become with your crowd that put you there. And that may be a hard hitting thing for someone in the industry to say that might be offensive to other people in the industry. And I actually don't care because I know I'm right. I'm not going to name names on, on your programme, but... I know people who have gone, yeah, be a great job if it weren't for the public. And um, I find that uh, sad, I suppose the word is, because it was that public that put you there, bought you your nice house on the Thames and whatever it is you got, you know. And uh, um, don't forget, but so many of them do. I'd say 90% of them do. I hope you realise how loved you are by the public and what an impact you made on people like me and other people who just like great entertainment because that's fundamentally what you are, an amazing entertainer who stands on a stage and captivates an audience without whistles and without flashing lights and smoke machines. It is just you and a guitar and that's thrilling and I think there should be more people like you on TV for that reason. Yeah, well, I, I do say it's a modern day troubadour existence um, in a concert like tonight, there's no lighting changes, there's nothing, there's no intro, I walk on. Hello, well they know it's me, I've bought a ticket, haven't they? And I don't do encores either, and I'm one of the rare people that don't do encores, there's no point, you know, you wear your shoes out. Um, I, I, I know I'm going to do an hour, and I know there's going to be an interval where I sign the books and the CDs and things, and then I know there's going to be another hour. And so do they. So what are the, what's the point, you know? <laughs> And so I am really a waltz and all, nuts and bolts act. It's all I ever wanted to be. And I'm very touched by what you say, you know, genuinely, I know it sounds twee, but I am touched that you say that, the, you know, that there's a bit of respect out there for, for the years I've done it. But I don't expect respect, but I do wallow in it a little bit. It's nice. So you should, you deserve it. Richard Digence, you can find you by going on the internet. Just put in Richard Digence, it's there. Your website, just for those who want to get tour dates. RichardDigest.com, actually. You're working really hard. That's what's interesting. I mean, you're yeah. on the road most of the time. Well, not most of the time. It, it splits between the documentary work, you know, f loads of incidental music. And uh, and then I'm, a, I'm a, actually a ghostwriter for quite some quite famous people who want autobiographies done. But obviously I can't say who because that's what, one of the parts of being a ghostwriter. But that's quite a big aspect of what I do these days. And coming out and doing gigs is, is like a bit of being on holiday for me, you know, so it's really, really great. And I'm very open, even on my website that you just very kindly plugged, you know, they can send an email off my website and it don't go to nine people and four <laughs> agents. It comes to Richard Digence, you know, and um, rd at richarddigence.com. It is that basic. And if they want a song like tonight, they might have emailed me yesterday or whatever and I'm very open and if I reply and say sorry don't remember that one oh thanks Richard you know and you think maybe I, am I the only one that's really k keeping base with the punters here Richard I just I'll let you get ready because yeah. there's uh, a full audience waiting for you thank you for being <laughs> you and congratulations for all the memories as well Richard thank you pleasure mate